Okay, great. Well, hello and welcome everyone to the England Study Abroad Information Session. My name is Piper O'Sullivan and I'm the Assistant Director of Study Abroad and I manage three programs that we offer in England along with programs in Ireland and all over Asia. Tonight we're going to review the University of York, the University of Leicester, and then finally, the University of Sussex. These are all world-renowned universities, and I'm very proud to say that Holy Cross has had long-standing institutional partnerships with all of them. And since I've been working at Holy Cross, I've been very fortunate to learn a lot about these three different programs uh, in England from students who have studied abroad there, and I encourage you to speak with your peers who have studied abroad, especially our study abroad ambassadors who are current seniors and volunteer to speak with prospective students. And a list of them can be found on our website, sa.holycross.edu. And so I encourage you to speak with them because that way you can gain a better understanding of what it's like to be a student in one of these locations and hear what advice they have for you as a prospective student. So tonight I'm joined by a former Holy Cross student, Ellen Chen. Welcome. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us where you studied abroad and, and what you studied at Holy Cross? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Ellen Chen. Uh, I studied abroad um, at the University of York, and I can't believe it, it was five years ago. <laughs> um, I currently live in Waltham, um, and I work at a biotech company in Cambridge. Great, thank you. So in my role as assistant director, I help students apply to our programs. I can also help answer any questions about the financial aspects of study abroad, course registration, logistics, and your health and safety while overseas. Beginning in October, my schedule will be rather flexible, so I encourage all of you to please reach out to me as you work on your applications. You can schedule a meeting with me through our website or simply attend my Zoom office hours that I hold every Friday. And I want to emphasize that wherever you study abroad, it's a two-part process. First, you need to finish your Holy Cross application, which is due November 6th. And then once I approve your application, then you move on to the second part, which is to apply directly to a university, hopefully in England. So to help orient you, oh, sorry. This, these are the three uh, locations in relation to each other. England, it's a small country, obviously. It's about the same size as Louisiana, as a reference. And England has a population of 55 million people. London is obviously the capital in the southeastern region of the country. And among these three universities, Sussex, near Brighton down here, is the closest location that to London. And it only takes about an hour by train from um, Brighton to London. And the train runs frequently. Uh, I had one student who studied abroad there at Sussex who said he went to London every weekend. And then in the uh, East Midlands area is the University of Leicester. Um, and it has the highest population among these three cities with about 330,000 residents. Leicester to London by train is an hour and a half. And then finally, York is the smallest city in relation to the others and is located in the northern region. And it takes about two to two and a half hours by train to reach London. So, Ellen, I was wondering, did you take some trains while you were there in England? Was it generally like an easy country to get around? Oh, for sure. It was definitely easy to go 
pretty much everywhere in England by train. Actually, if um, as a student, and I think it's under 24 years old, you can buy this train card where you get discounted train rides. Um, so you just need to carry that um, whenever you go on the train. And usually you would buy your train ticket online. Um, so that made it a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I remember taking trains to London, it'd be two and a half hours. Um, I've taken a train to Scotland and I think that took about four and a half hours. But um, if like somewhere was like flooding or something like um, York actually floods from time to time. Uh, it might take you eight hours, but um, train is definitely one of the fastest ways to get around in England. Great, thank you. And so let's first take a look at the city of York. Here are some iconic images of the city. Uh, these were actually taken from a PowerPoint from Claire Postel. I don't know if you worked with her in York, Ellen, yeah. Um, so she visited Holy Cross this time last year and gave a PowerPoint and was generous enough to share it with me. So um, it's a world famous historic city that attracts about 7.1 million visitors each year. It's known as the cultural capital of the North. And it was originally founded by the Romans in the year 71 and was later developed by the Vikings and the Normans. And York is known as one of the most safest cities in the UK. And here we see York Minster. It's a famous medieval church with an underground Roman basilica that's still intact. And then the River Ouse that runs through North Yorkshire. And then the Shambles is a section of York. It was a former um, meat packing district of, or sort of full of butcher shops, but you can still obviously see the architecture there from the 14th century. And the universities of York and Lancaster um, often compete with one another, so they have these rowing comp competitions along with other sporting events. So Ellen, do you, do you mind, um, can you explain or share what York is like for somebody who's never been there before? Yeah, sure. Um, so the University of York is kind of broken off into, into two kind of campuses. So you have East and West campuses. Um, I think I lived on East. It's been a while, so I can't really remember. But um, the architecture is amazing. You'll see um, buildings, pretty much made like in the 13th century, 12th century, basically older than America itself, um, with combined with buildings who were built in the 70s. So if you're into architecture like I am, um, it's, it's very interesting to live around. Um, getting around campus, it's pretty easy. There's a shuttle that goes by um, pretty much every 15, 20 minutes to an hour, depending on the type of day. Um, but it, it's also pretty easy just to bike around campus, which uh, a lot of students do. So York, even though it's a medieval city, or even older than that, um, the campus was founded in the 60s. And it has a collegiate system that's similar to Oxford, Cambridge, and Durham. And it's divided into three faculties, the humanities, the sciences, and then the social sciences. And some of its academic strengths include literature, history, medieval studies, education, art history, theater, psychology, sociology, physics, chemistry, and math. And um, were you, you were a math major, right, at Holy Cross? Yeah, I was a math uh, major, and I also minored in art history. Oh, perfect. Were you able to study both of those subjects while you were there? Yeah, actually, I ended up um, getting my minor pretty much um, at the University of York. I don't think I would have been able to take as many courses at Holy Cross uh, if I didn't take them at University of York. Mm -hmm. And I should mention also that its literature department ranks in the top three of the world and it offers courses both in English literature and world literature. So if you're an English major, definitely consider this as an option. 
So in terms of when you can attend the University of York, you can select either the full academic year abroad, which begins in late September and ends in mid-June, or you can attend for the spring and summer terms that begins in mid-January and then again ends in mid-June. And some departments require full year attendance, such as biology, biochemistry, biomedical sciences, and psychology, because the modules there are designed as year long. So courses are called mod modules, and the credit system is different. In the UK, your goal is to earn a total of 120 credits for the year, or 60 credits if you attend for the spring and summer terms. And the modules vary in terms of the number of credits. Some are 10, other ones are 20, some are 30. And then to prepare for study abroad, I encourage you to please meet with your departmental study abroad advisor. And the list of who these professors are appear on our website. Uh, also on the same website, the essay.holycross.edu, is a collection of PDFs, which lists all the courses taken by Holy Cross students at all of our study abroad programs. And so it's a very useful resource to be able to compare these three programs in England. And if there's a particular class that you're interested in, but it, but it hasn't been taken before uh, by a Holy Cross student, you'll have the opportunity to have it evaluated by the registrar's office at Holy Cross. It will usually be approved as long as it isn't a business law or marketing course or a course of similar content that, that you've already taken at Holy Cross or something that requires a class that requires you um, to take it at Holy Cross specifically. So wherever you study abroad, your classes can fulfill major, minor, common area requirements and fulfill elective requirements. Or you can just take something completely new. The choice is yours. And there are academic support services available to you should you need them. And I know you've already kind of spoken about what the campus is like. And what was your sort of overall uh, academic experience there? And was yeah, and if you can remember, what were some of the subjects that you really enjoyed? Yeah, um, so I feel like my overall academic experience, um, one word that encapsulates it, it was hard. <laughs> um, so being a, um, a math major, uh, math is pretty much harder everywhere outside of the U.S. because students have been um, pretty much figuring out what they wanted to major in college since high school. So in England, they do um, something called the A-level. So they've been studying um, that field for three years or, um, or even longer, depending on like what kind of student they are. Um, but I ended up taking advanced courses at University of York, just because of all the math courses I had already taken at Holy Cross. Um, so that was, that was an issue for me. The, uh, one of the main issues was kind of um, getting at everyone else's level, particularly just like listening to the professors with the accents because getting through the accents was <laughs> pretty difficult, let me tell you. Um, like I knew like, so like in math, for example, we use um, the Greek alphabet, like alpha, beta, but my math professors at Holy Cross never said Z and I, for, for the life of me, I was like, what is Z? Um, it was like my first course. He really just meant Z. So um, I honestly wish I looked up um, some like British terms <laughs> or how British people say certain terms before I left, but um, it was a struggle. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, yeah. understandable. Um, uh, so some of the, my favorite subjects um, were, were basically, I only took math and history of arts because um, another thing is um, you, in order to take a course at University of York, you have to have already a year of courses already. So for me, um, the only way 
I would have been allowed to take history of art was if I already had a year's worth of history of art courses already under my belt. So that's a thing to keep in mind. Right, because if you enroll in like 200 level, right, and 300 level classes when you study abroad. And I'm so glad you mentioned that it's different in the UK in the sense that students have been studying their major for so much longer. You know, um, like beginning in high school, they sort of develop a specialty. Um, so when, they're, when they start college, they already are kind of ahead of American students in that sense. Really good point. So in terms of eligibility, uh, a GPA of a 3.0 is recommended. If you have any concerns about your GPA, please feel free to contact me and I can take a look at your transcript. If you're just a little under a 3.0, then uh, try your best to raise it this current semester. Along those same lines, you cannot have any academic deficiencies uh, before your departure such as withdrawals or low number of credits. And again, I welcome you to contact me directly if you, if you have any questions about this. And if you attend York, Leicester, or Sussex for the academic year, you will complete a Holy Cross requirement known as an ICIP, which stands for Independent Cultural Immersion Project. So this project will not satisfy any kind of course requirements at Holy Cross, but it will be given a quarter of one Holy Cross credit. It will be, it will be graded and appear on your transcript. So essentially, it's meant to help you immerse yourself in your new community, and it can be achieved through three ways. First, you can do an internship in any field uh, that would be a productive and, and enriching experience for you that aligns with your professional goals. Another ICIP option is a community-based learning project where you volunteer on a regular basis uh, with an agency that is uh, specifically devoted to community service and or social justice. And this agency can be church affiliated or it can be secular, doesn't matter. And then uh, the third option is what we call follow your passion. And this is where you can develop a hobby that is of real interest to you and then write a reflective paper at the end of the year. And you can also produce a research paper of your choice. Oh, and I was going to ask, did, did you do an ICIP while you were there? Yeah, I did. Um, I wrote a paper. Uh, I think it was on um, gender in particular math. I think it was an extension of like women in STEM basically and comparing um, how it was like being a female math major in the U.S. versus in the U.K. Right, and did, was Claire your um, ICIP advisor for that project? Yeah, she was, um, and I miss her, and she was literally the kindest lady ever. Yeah, yeah she's super nice. So, um, and I should mention that at all three of these universities are ICIP advisors like Claire, who will work close, who will work closely with you over the academic year to complete this requirement. And they can help find you an internship or a volunteer location. And they will also be the ones grading your ICIP. And on to extracurricular activities. One of the things our office encourages is for students to explore university clubs, student organizations, or sports while you're abroad so you can integrate yourself into your new community and continue to do the things that you enjoy at Holy Cross while you're abroad. There are 200 student groups or societies and 60 sport clubs at York, so please take some time to think about which extracurricular activities would be of interest to you. And it can be difficult to feel a sense of belonging if you just limit your interactions with students to only the classroom. 
because the lecture sizes are so large. And so a good way to make new friends or expand your social network is to join a club. And did you have time to join any student organizations while, while you were there? Yep. Yeah, um, so part of being a math major, I joined Math Society, um, basically where lectures were held, uh, I think on the monthly basis. But I also actually played for the Univers University of York softball team. Um, but I didn't seek out these opportunities. They kind of came to me. Um, so softball, as you know, is a U.S. sport. <laughs> um, and I struck up the conversation of one of my course mates. Um, and he noticed that I had an American accent. And he asked me if I ever played softball. And I said, well, yeah, we grow up playing it in gym class. Um, so he asked me to try it out. Um, and I ended up making the team. <laughs> so that's great. I want to um, mention that whichever program you select, there are on-site cultural advisors employed by Holy Cross who will be there to organize a welcome dinner, field trips, and offer support services to you. So these were some of the um, trips that Claire had mentioned that she's taken students on over the years. Um, so here are some examples. You have Whitby is just north of York and it's right along the coast right here. And it's famous for uh, James Cook who sailed from Whitby to Australia in the 18th century. And Whitby Abbey inspired uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And then just south of Whitby is this amazing uh, parkland called the National York Moors. And the Romans built several roads going through this. Um, so you can still sort of see one of the roads right there um, at Weedale. And then also Claire will take you to the Bronte Museum, uh, which is the family home of the Bronte sisters. Charlotte, Emily, and Anne, who were all famous novelists in the 19th century. And you'll also see Revo Abbey. It's a famous monastery that dates back to the 12th century. And in the 16th century, Henry VIII closed it and confiscated all of its valuables. That's why it just looks like this nowadays. <laughs> So I was wondering, it would, I think it would be a really great time to look at some of the um, pictures, Ellen, that, that you have. So if you could share your screen, I can stop mm -hmm. sharing mine. Sorry, not sure what's going on. Oh, do you have, can you um, share your screen? Uh, uh, my computer's being a little, a little weird right now. I could, uh, you know, I have, I have it loaded on my computer so I can okay. do it for you. I can do that. Yeah, I think I okay, I'll do that. There it is. You can just tell me when you want me to go to the next slide. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is the University of York. Well, actually on the right, you'll see University of York. And then uh, on the picture on the left, you'll see uh, a picture from the York Wall, which um, is, I think it's one of the uh, longest surviving Roman wall in Europe, actually. Um, so you get to walk around that and that's just the view. Um, so on the next page, um, you'll see a picture of look left because of course in England they drive on the wrong side of the road um, so you don't want to look right and then left because then you might get hit by by something um, and that'd be <laughs> terrible uh, and then on the picture of left you'll see a picture of how how green York is um, there's a lot of green yeah <laughs> um, 
but that fresh English air, it's definitely, it's definitely hits different, if you know what I mean. Uh, so if you go to the next picture, you'll see a collage of, of York uh, just walking through. So on the picture of the right, you'll see the minster. Um, and then on the picture of the left, you'll see, um, uh, is it scrambles? It's shambles. Um, and base, it, um, it's like this famous street that uh, inspired Diagon Alley, if you're a Harry Potter fan. Um, and then um, on the bottom left, you'll see a picture of me and two other Holy Cross girls who went to the University of York and were celebrating my birthday. I had just turned 21, um, but too bad because the drinking limit there is 18, of course, it's different. Um, on the next page, um, you'll see just me and my flatmates. Um, so in my living accommodations was I, I lived in an apartment. I had a single room with my own bathroom, um, but we had a shared common space and that was the kitchen. And um, we'd have flatmate dinners. Sometimes we cook together and all my flatmates happen to be international students like me. Um, so we essentially would cook whatever country we we're from um, and just share share food with each other. And then when we didn't want to cook, um, being college students, no matter where you are, everyone loves pizza. So sometimes we get takeout um, and order pizza. And then on the next page, um, you'll see a, a picture of me and my team. Uh, I think on the right, it's a picture of when we won our second place at our first tournament of the season. Um, the person, the team who beat us actually uh, was sponsored by Olay, um, so we ended up getting Olay products as our as our prize, <laughs> which was a little random, but you know it was, it was you know it, they're worth it. <laughs> um, and then on on the left, you'll see a picture of us at um, the colors ball. It's basically in England. There's a lot of formal dinners and a lot of um, balls uh, where you get to dress up and and eat dinner and um, have a great time with whoever your club is, basically, whoever your people are. Uh, and then on the next page, um, like school, there are always field trips, um, depending on what major. And for me, um, art history gave me the opportunity to travel all over England to see museums and right here, um, sculpture gardens. Um, particularly on the left, you'll see me next to a sheep. And apparently I was that brave American because none of my course mates wanted to get near them, but they were like, she's American, just let her go. So that was me. Uh, and then on the next page, another great opportunity while you're studying abroad, you'll be able to travel. So we talked about trains earlier, but there's also buses. You could bus down to London. Yeah, it might be, it might take longer, but it's a lot cheaper and I had actually just looked at the conversion rate um, right before the Zoom call. It's so much cuter than when it was when I studied abroad. It was, um, I think it was one pound for $1.50 USD, but now it's a lot better, I think, because of like recent events. Um, but uh, so this is just a collage of me and my friends traveling. So um, uh, you'll see, Actually, no one in this collage other than me studied at the University of York. Everyone else studied um, in different at different universities. Uh, you'll see my friend Keith studying at the University of Oxford. And then we had another friend who was studying at the Loyola University in Rome. Um, so you really get, to, you know, the pick of whatever city you want to travel to because it's fast and pretty inexpensive. Um, and then on the next page, I think it's the final page, you also get to visit Montserrat if you like, um, named after, of course, like how the Jesuits were founded. Um, it's about, I think it took us a total of five hours to climb up and down, but it was totally worth it. Um, although we got lost a bit, <laughs> we got off the trail a bit, but we found our way. Um, and it's amazing to be up there and, and see what all the, like, I guess, like, all the fuss about what everyone was telling how we had to go. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Five hours. That's that is quite a hike. For sure. yeah. So let me stop here and then Can everyone see that, Lester? So Lester has the largest number of people aged 19 and under in the East Midlands region. It's one of the most ethnically diverse areas of the UK, and it's also one of the most affordable places to live in the country. Did you get a chance to visit uh, the East Midlands or Leicester area while, while you were there? Oh, Ellen, I was wondering if you, did you get to visit Lester? Oh, um, uh, no, it was, it, sorry, it wasn't, it wasn't one of the places. Oh, yeah. Um, so, the, um, it's famous definitely for, these are some photos right here, for the biggest Diwali festival outside of India. It's the Festival of Lights, which is celebrated by Hindus. Jains, Sikhs, and some Buddhists every autumn. And Leicester was also the place of Britain's first radio station. And the remains of Richard III right here were found in the, by the archaeology uh, department at the University uh, of Leicester. And there is another just a beautiful photo of shops and older architecture, kind of Tudor style. And the Leicester campus has an abundance of green spaces and it's next to 69 acres of parkland. About 18,000 students attend the university, 11,000 of whom are undergraduates. Approximately 4,000 international students study at Leicester and it's proud of its long-standing record on social inclusiveness. Some of its academic strengths include psychology, sociology, astrophysics, uh, physics, biology, especially genetics. It is actually the home um, to the invention of genetic fingerprinting and DNA profiling. And so I always recommend STEM majors to consider Lester um, because it's quite strong in the sciences. And it's also strong in literature, history, political science, art history, and then of course, ancient history and archaeology. So a minimum GPA of a 3.0 is recommended, um, but if it's below that, then the applicant is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. You can attend for the full year, the fall, or the spring, so there's a lot of flexibility. Just remember that the academic calendar starts a little bit later in the UK, and so it runs from mid-September and then ends in mid-June. And for some of the science fields, um, you have to, if you attend just for the fall, then your final exams occur in January, so you may be required to stay abroad uh, during Christmas. Although some professors will allow you to uh, request taking the exam a little bit earlier um, in December. It just depends on the module. Uh, the credit system is more uniform than the University in, of York in that every module is conveniently 15 credits. So you will enroll in four modules per semester. And then like York, Leicester has a number of student-run organizations that you can read about online at this website. If you're interested in having a copy of this PowerPoint, just email me and I'll be happy to share it with you so you can click on these links that are embedded. And of course, uh, as I mentioned before, if you stay for the whole year, you will do an ICIP. And I was wondering if you please will play. Oh, good. 
Um, since we don't have any returnees here tonight who studied abroad at Leicester, I thought we could just watch a couple of short videos that will give you a sense of what the campus is like. And then the second video um, shows what some of the student organizations are. So let me know if you can hear this audio. The best things about coming to Leicester to study is just how friendly everyone is and there's just so many different kinds of people to talk to and so many faces and it's just been really nice to get to know everyone. So the University of Leicester's campus is a really close-knit campus so it's really easy to get from one lecture to another and every single day you always like to see someone that you know which is really good. I like that Victoria Park was sort of a part of it. I love green and nature. I remember thinking, wow, this is my library, it looks really cool. The library's five stories of anything a student doing research in their subject needs. It's got millions of books, there's even online books that you can have a look at from the comfort of your own bed if, if you need. There's group study rooms, so you can book those if you have a group project. So it's always thriving full of life really. It's a good place to go to study. So on the campus itself, it's not just a series of teaching rooms. You've also got your students' union at the heart of the campus, the Percy G building. And now you've got various shops and places to just generally chill out as well. The Market Square is a great new facility for students. So not only do we get to buy the normal sandwiches and salads, there's also kind of bagels and bubble tea, curries and pasties, all sorts. So such a variety. Two nights a week we have the Student Union, which is also an O2 Academy, so you can go and see some absolutely amazing acts. We have the Catfish and Bottle Men, the Kooks, DJ Zane Lowe, that was just, just a selection of them. So university life is a lot more than just your academic work. You can get really get involved and try new things. There's always something for everyone because we have so many societies. And even if there isn't one already, you can set up your own society and then you can start your own thing for everyone else to enjoy, which is really good. I am part of the radio society, which I had no experience beforehand. And that's one of the things I loved about societies is you can have no idea about it and you can get involved. So skills that you might gain outside of your degree will definitely help you become a more well-rounded individual and help you with your appeal for graduate employment. So on to Brighton. Brighton is just a 16 minute drive or by train a 10 minute trip uh, from the University of, Sus uh, University of Sussex heading south. The city has a very vibrant nightlife, lots of small shops and a beautiful seafront. The beach is rocky, not a sandy one unfortunately, but nevertheless it's very beautiful and I love how the storefronts are painted in these fun colors to create a welcoming feeling. Were you able to visit Brighton, Ellen, while you were there? No? Yeah, it's kind of off. The, it's so far from York. Yeah. And so uh, Brighton is home to the largest um, LGBTQ pride festival in the UK. And it's known as the queer capital of England. It is also known as the hipster capital of England as well. And this photo here is of the Royal Pavilion, which attracts around 400,000 people every year. And it was a former uh, royal re residence built in the late 18th century. And then this is a pic of the Ferris wheel that's near the beachfront. And then this is a photo from um, the Pride Festival in Brighton. So the University of Sussex was the first of the new wave of UK universities founded in the 60s. Sussex is situated next to parkland like Leicester. Uh, so it has a lot of green spaces nearby and around 13,000 students attend, the majority of whom are undergraduates. 
and there are more than 5,000 international students from over 140 countries. Its academic strengths include geography and environmental studies, political science, anthropology, sociology, psychology, math, literature, and history. And also for people interested in literature, the library has a, a special collection which holds the original manuscripts and first editions by Virginia Woolf, Jane Austen, and Rudyard Kipling. In terms of admissions, it's similar to the other universities that we've talked about in the UK. The 3.0 GPA is recommended. Um, the difference, though, for the University of York is that it is an academic year only program. So you can't just go for one semester. And then again, it's on the same timeline. It starts in mid September, and then the academic year ends in mid June. And um, Let's see. Also, uh, also similar, I should say, just in the credit system, it mirrors Leicester in the sense that you would take four modules uh, per semester. So let's watch this video first. <laughs> I've seen the Fisher is very yesterday, it was really amazing with the clubs and everything. I joined the photograph one. Yeah. Because I have a good camera. I signed up for basketball and tennis, yeah. I signed up for quite a lot. Um, lots of sports and then some random ones which I thought I'd try out, lots of new things, yeah. We are the Sussex Mohawks, I was with Frisbee team. We're the University of Sussex uh, Pirate Society. And we're the Sussex Capital of Angola Society. I'm set up for kite surfing, skew diving, and rugby. I signed up for badminton, archery, the animation club. <laughs> also fisting, I found that really good. Uh, the Christian Union, I've looked into. I've looked into um, uh, kind of campaigning as well for different uh, human rights. Uh, I joined tennis club. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I wanted to join badminton club too. I would like to join ukulele club. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Signed up for table tennis, poker, basketball, stuff like that. I signed up for the Afro Caribbean one, um, the mechanical engineering one, um, the investment banking one, um, I think the Mexican one. <laughs> this is the University of Sussex Fashion
I think my favorite is the Pirates Club. <laughs> and so um, on to accommodations, your housing and meals. York has nine colleges, um, also known as living centers. And some of them are catered while other ones have a shared kitchen. And uh, Ellen, you've already shared that you had your own bedroom, but you had a kind of a communal kitchen and, and living room with roommates. And um, in Leicester, you will be housed in near campus accommodations, mostly for international students. And the majority of them are self catered, meaning that you don't have a meal plan and you're not charged the Holy Cross, um, you know, uh, board fee for your time abroad. So it's up to you how you want to budget for your meals. And then in, at Sussex, you're guaranteed university managed accommodations. And again, meals are self-catered. So this is pretty typical. Um, most of the on-campus housing in the UK is comprised of these single rooms. And you'll, sometimes you'll have your own bedroom or bathroom as well, um, depending on your housing arrangement. So in terms of academic, uh, academic differences in the UK, this also applies to Ireland as well. Um, studying abroad in England, there is frequently only one, uh, sometimes one or two assignments or final exams that accounts for your entire course grade. So there are resources available if you feel uh, like you're struggling and would like extra help, but know that you won't be monitored or continuously assessed like you are at Holy Cross with multiple assignments throughout the semester. So you'll need to take the initiative should you need assistance. Um, and you should always be what we recommend studying uh, for each class more than double the amount of time that you're actually in the class. And then before your departure, it's beneficial to educate yourself with the grade conversion sheets that are provided on the registrar's office that you can see that if you receive a 70 for your final exam, that that is the equivalent of an A. So these are sort of my final questions for you, Ellen. I was wondering if you could speak to how has study abroad impacted you personally, academically, career-wise, and then also what advice do you have for somebody who's never been abroad before, who's never left the United States, and might feel a little hesitant about this whole thing? Um, so I, I can definitely say studying abroad definitely impacted me. Um, I didn't expect it to impact me so much. Um, like, for example, me and my friends still talk about our time studying abroad, even though it was five years ago. Um, I still talk to my teammates and course mates, um, even though that was five years ago. We still keep in touch, um, Facebook, Instagram. Um, um, Career-wise, I don't, I don't know if it has affected me that much, though whenever someone, like an interviewer, asked me what's excite, what one exciting thing have I done in my life, and my answer is always studying abroad. Um, my advice, uh, if you're hesitant, just do it, because I was hesitant. I had never left the country before studying abroad. I actually had to apply for my passport, um, and you know i was really scared but you know i got through it it was amazing i still talk about it um and you should definitely do it great thank you and quickly i'll just review the finances uh, there are no additional fees associated with applying for study abroad um, in terms of billing all students will be billed holy cross room and tuition and if you're the recipient of financial aid, that transfers over to your time abroad, whether you go for the semester or for the year. Every student receives an activity budget. It's $175 for the semester, $200 for the academic year. And this money is to help uh, cover the expenses uh, involved with joining any cultural activities, a club or a sports group. And we make it pretty easy where you just take a photo of your receipt and then email it to our office. And then in terms of 
flights, you are responsible for buying your own round trip ticket, but you do receive a travel credit from Holy Cross that is equal to the cost of an average um, round trip to, uh, flight from Boston to the UK. So for example, um, last year it was $835 for York and Sussex, but this amount varies year by year. And then finally, visas, um, you are responsible for paying visa fees. It's quite expensive for the uh, four-tier visa that's required for academic year students. The total is $620. That includes the, app the application fee for the visa, as well as the healthcare surcharge fee. And then for semester-only students, it's about half that amount, 320. So a quick overview, please speak with your academic advisors. Um, there's, like I said, a study abroad advisor for each department. The application for our website is really straightforward. You just write a two-page essay about why you want to study abroad and why um, you've chosen this particular university and what you imagine studying there and extracurricular activities that you would like to participate in. One letter of recommendation is required. You upload your unofficial transcript from STAR. And then again, the deadline is November 6th. Um, I encourage you to start early so that our portal doesn't crash or overload with everybody logging in and uh, trying to finish their applications on November 5th. And then after I approve your study abroad application, like I said, I'll help you apply to the university directly. And then much later comes the pre-departure meetings. Um, so the, these are meetings where we talk about the logistics and finances and visas in more, de more detail. So my final remarks, um, please get a passport if you don't already have one or renew your passport if it looks like it's going to expire soon. And the Office of Study Abroad closely monitors the uh, COVID pandemic every week. Safety is our top priority. We won't send you abroad to your destination that doesn't meet our criteria for health and safety standards. And then lastly, every Holy Cross student will pay a fee that's less than $200 for international health insurance and emergency assistance. This is known as International SOS, and Cigna is the healthcare provider.